Oh. My name is Joshua Furman. I'm the curator of the Houston Jewish History Archive at Rice University. Today is December 28th, 2020, and I'm here with Jay Kent Friedman. Kenny, how are you? I'm well, Josh. Thanks. How about you? I'm doing great. Thanks for taking the time to um, be with us to talk about your childhood and family history and um, your career and, and all that you've done here uh, in Houston in the community. So tell us a little bit about um, your childhood and where you grew up. Well, I grew up in Biloxi, Mississippi, an unusual place for a Jewish boy to grow up. Uh, my dad was in the service, and when he was shipped overseas, my mother went to live with her sister and her sister's husband, who lived in Biloxi, Mississippi. They had a uh, ladies ready-to-wear store there, and she stayed there until my dad got out of the service. And when he did, at the end of World War II, he came back there and started his own clothing store, a men's clothing store in, uh, in Biloxi. Mm -hmm. so that's where I grew up. And when, when were you born, Kenny? 1944, February 12, 1944. 1944. Okay. So, I mean, give us, give us like a sense of what it was like to grow up in, you know, a small town in the South as a Jewish kid. What was that like? Uh, you know, it was a great experience for me. Uh, Biloxi is on the Gulf Coast and um, it uh, is predominantly Catholic and uh, has no real uh, agricultural history like um, most of the South. And so um, we didn't have uh, any slave trade there or that kind of thing. And so um, it was, you know, it was pretty easy. Uh, frankly, there were so few Jews in town that we were kind of like the Greek family in town, right? <laughs> we were just not a threat to anybody, um, but there were just a handful of Jewish families. Mm -hmm. And then what about, um anti-Semitism or, or pressure to convert? Did, did anybody ever, you know, talk to you and say things like, you know, Christ killer or, or things like that? No, no, I never heard any of that. I never heard any of that. I had some uh, close friends, some boys who lived across the street from me um, who were Catholic, who uh, were very concerned about me uh, going to hell if I hadn't been baptized. And so they uh, quietly baptized me one day in their home. But uh, uh, other than that's as close as I ever came to any kind of overt uh, discrimination of any kind. And they, and they were doing it for the right, but at least in their hearts were the right reasons. Did they, did they explain what they were doing? I mean, did they dunk your head in a bathtub? What happened? They sprinkled holy water on my head. Their mother has a great story about, you know, being quiet in the house and her realizing that was unusual and sneaking up the stairs just as they were, just as they were sprinkling, sprinkling holy water on my head and baptizing me. I was about seven or eight and, uh, uh for several months, I thought I was Catholic. I uh, wouldn't eat meat on Fridays and things like that. And uh, to my parents' everlasting credit, they just went with the flow of that. And uh, after a few months, I, you know, kind of reverted to normal. Uh huh. Okay. And then t t tell us a little bit more about the, the Jewish community there. Was there a rabbi? Was there a synagogue? How did it work? Uh, no, when I was growing up, there was not a rabbi there. We all always brought in a rabbi uh, from. Um, New Orleans or Mobile, both of which were fairly close uh, for the High Holy Days. Um, I, I was fortunate and that when I was about to be 13, there was a Jewish chaplain on the Air Force Base, Keesler Air Force Base there, and so he did my bar mitzvah. Um, most people believe I was the first person ever bar mitzvah in Biloxi, Mississippi uh, because of that, but um, it was such a long time ago that my Catholic friends across the street had to get permission from the church to attend the bar mitzvah because that was at a time when the Catholic church would not allow their uh, parishioners to, to attend other services, not Jewish, any other services of any kind. Wow. Wow. Incredible. Yeah. What about like Rosh Hashanah, Passover? Do you have you know memories of how the holidays were observed in Biloxi growing up? Uh, yeah, I have wonderful memories of that. My parents were very um, open and sharing, and we always had uh, extra people at our home for those uh, special holidays, usually servicemen who were stationed at the Air Force Base and uh, were away from home, of course. And uh, so we always had a number of them over for uh, those kinds of holidays. Mm -hmm. it was a wonderful time. Yeah. Wonderful time. Tell me more about, about your parents. We, we haven't said much about them to, to date. What were their names? How did they meet? Yeah. Uh, my mother's name was Rose Froelich, F-R-O-H-L-I-C-H. Uh, she was born in New York, but grew up in Montgomery, Alabama, which is where her family ended up. Mm -hmm. My father's name was Earl Friedman, and uh, he grew up in Port Arthur, Texas, uh, which is where his family ended up. 
Um, they met uh, when my mother was working for a uh, chain millinery store, hats and things, and was uh, sent to Port Arthur, Texas to run their store there. Um, mm. So they married in 1941, and I was born in 44. Born in 44. And then the the store that your that your family had. Tell me a, a bit about the store. What did you guys sell? Did you grow up working in the store? Grew up working in the store. It was called Kent's, named after me, um, K E N T apostrophe S. Um, and uh, I did grow up working in the store. I, I enjoyed being in the store. Both my parents worked in the store, um, and uh, you know it was just, it was part just part of the family. Mm -hmm. and then I had a younger sister who was four years younger, who is four years younger than I am. Um, she stayed in Mississippi. She and her husband now live in Jackson, Mississippi, but uh, it's the only really family left in Mississippi for me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What about, you know, growing up in the South in the, in the era of Jim Crow? I mean, can you talk about life, you know, as a, as a Jewish kid in a segregated town, what that was like? What do you, what do you remember about, about that time? <clears throat> Well, it was clearly very segregated, and uh, schools were segregated, and um, I was a beneficiary of that segregation because I played a lot of sports and probably wouldn't have had an opportunity to play as much sports if the teams had been integrated. But um, you know, it was it was very segregated, and um, although there was always a lot of interaction between the African American community and the Anglo community. Um, I never saw much in the way of animosity towards uh, African American people, just that they were um, considered to be different and separate and apart. And, um, and that was a, clearly a very strongly ingrained feeling uh, in Mississippi. Um, and uh, I remember my dad once talking about how uh, terrible it was that we asked people of color to serve in the armed services and to put their life on the line for the country. And then when they came home, they didn't have an opportunity to do things that everybody else had the opportunity to do. And uh, I was very offended by that. And so consequently, I grew up offended by that as well. Sure, of course. Um, in many ways, you know, this, this narrative is like a lot of stories of, of um, Jewish families in the South at that time, you know, in the 40s and 50s. And, um, you know, lots of families owned stores. And um, did you did you have any ambition or, or desire to to stay in Mississippi, or were you always planning as soon as you graduated high school to to leave and not come back? And to what extent did your did your parents want you to come back? I think my parents always wanted me to go do something else. Um, they always thought that the uh, clothing business was a difficult way to make a living, and that uh, it would be better if I had a professional degree of some sort. Um, and so I was always sort of aimed towards doing something other than uh, being in the clothing business uh, in Biloxi, Mississippi. Yeah. It's a problem that all small towns in the South have. It's, it's, it's people grow up, uh, there's just not a lot of opportunity there. And so there's much more opportunity elsewhere, usually in larger cities someplace. Right, yeah, this, this does happen. We should talk a little bit about, about your high school experiences. I know that you uh, played a little baseball, right? And you- uh, Baseball and football and ran track and ran track, did, did all of those things. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I had, a, I had a wonderful high school experience. Uh, 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 I enjoyed all of my time in high school. I enjoyed my classmates. Um, I was elected as a senior, I was elected president of the Mississippi Association of Student Councils. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, my, my first really confrontation of racism came when I went to a international student council conference uh, in Wisconsin uh, in my senior year. And Mississippi was one of the states that had two representatives instead of one. We had the president of the Mississippi Association of Student Councils, who was me, and the president of the Mississippi Association of Black Student Councils, uh, a young woman from, I think, Jackson, as I recall. Um, and so, you know, there were a handful of states that had two people there. Most people, most states only had one. Wow. So you graduated high school in um, what year? 1961. 61. Graduated from high school. I uh, was fortunate enough to have uh, some uh, sports scholarship offers at uh, several places and uh, ended up at Tulane, 
uh, which was a great decision for me. Um, it was a wonderful place to go to school. It was the first time I'd spent a lot of time around a predominantly Jewish community, uh, was at Tulane, and um, joined a fraternity there, which was very helpful. Um, again, played baseball at Tulane, and uh, one of the few Jewish players on the team, uh, which was not unusual. I mean, that's the way it was for me all of my life. Right. What what position did you play? I should have asked you earlier. So mostly shortstop uh, and some uh, center field. Uh, in the summer times in American Legion ball, I played center field. Uh, but mostly during during the, my high school and college days, I played shortstop. Gotcha, gotcha. Was there was there any you know bit of a culture shock coming from Biloxi? Not a lot of Jewish kids to you know Tulane, which has been something of a magnet for. Jewish kids across the South. Was that was that an eye-opening experience for you in some ways? No, it really wasn't. It was a fairly easy transition for me. Um, uh, many of the kids at Tulane who were Jewish came from small towns in the South as well, and uh, from Louisiana and Mississippi and Alabama and places like that. Oh, there was a fair number from the East Coast also, uh, but it was a relatively easy transition. I mean, I'd grown up in a you know a Jewish in a, in a synagogue and you know, with observing holidays and things. And so um, it was it was just not a difficult transition, but it was the first time I'd spent much time around peers who were Jewish from really all over the country. Uh -huh. And what did you uh, decide to study at Tulane? Uh, I was a business major. Uh, didn't know what I wanted to do exactly, but I figured business of some sort was what I wanted to do. And um, uh, about midway through my junior year, I, you know, finally realized I wasn't going to probably wasn't going to be a major league baseball player and uh, probably I'd go to class and pay attention. And uh, on a whim, I applied to law school and got in. And so they let me in after three years of undergraduate school. So I, my senior year of college, I spent actually in law school. And so I graduated early because of that. And that was also at, at Tulane, right? Yes, it was all at Tulane, yes. And what, what, what or, or who inspired you to consider law as a career? You know, I'm not quite sure. That's a great question, Josh. I'm not quite sure. I, nobody in my family had been a lawyer. Um, I didn't, didn't really know any lawyers. Um, it just seemed like it would be of interest to me. I really can, I think at that time I thought I was going to probably be in business anyway, but I thought a law background would be a benefit to me uh, in the business world. So uh, went to law school. Mm -hmm. Great. And, and what was that like? I mean, what, what subjects in law school will appeal to you the most? Um, I thought law school was the most interesting intellectual experience I'd had. Uh, it's clearly very cerebral, much different than certainly high school or even college in terms of the Socratic method of teaching. Um, and uh, my classmates were all very bright and very impressive. And uh, so it was, it was a wonderful time for me. I really enjoyed it a lot. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then tell us about um, how you ended up in Boston. Well, about halfway through law school, I realized that if I was going to go to law school, I probably should have gone someplace else. Not that I wasn't enjoying Tulane, but just because it was an opportunity to see another part of the country. Mm -hmm. And so when I uh, was graduating, I applied to several firms in New York and Boston and was fortunate enough to an opportunity with a large firm in Boston, uh, Sullivan and Wooster, the name of that firm. And uh, so I moved to Boston and, and spent a little more than two years there. I also got a master's in tax law at Boston University while I was there. They had a program that you could do part time. So I did that. And okay. um, that, was, that was a good experience as well. Um, Boston was great. I loved being there. Uh, it was significantly more segregated than Biloxi, Mississippi was, to my, much to my surprise. Uh, everybody in Boston lived in enclaves. There was a Jewish section and an Irish section and an Italian section and a black section and so forth. And there wasn't much interaction between them. Um, Boston had just come through a very difficult time with school integration. Uh, and there were, a lot, there were a lot of angry people in uh, Boston. I'm, Again, much to my surprise, I thought it was going to be a sort of a bastion of liberalism, but it was not at all. Yeah. What what years were you there? 67 and 68. 67 and 68. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And, and, uh, and then were you, were you already married by then? I was married. I got married uh, my senior year of law school um, uh, 
and uh, actually after my first year of law school, I went, when I would have been a graduate uh, from undergraduate school and uh, already had a child when we moved to Boston. Okay, got it. All right. Yeah. And then, so why did you decide not, not to stay up north? <clears throat> Um, well, as much as I enjoyed being in that part of the country, just because it was so different, uh, I pretty quickly realized that in Boston, to be successful, you either had to have a lot of money or come from a family pedigree of some sort. And since I had neither, I decided maybe I should go someplace else to try to make my fame and fortune. And I wanted to come back to the South, wanted to live in a big city. Uh, pretty quickly narrowed that down to Houston and Atlanta. I was fortunate enough to get opportunities in both places. Selected Houston, it was a great decision for me. Although Atlanta's a wonderful city, uh, Houston was a great place. And uh, I tell people all the time, Houston has made lots of successes out of a lot of very ordinary folk. You just kind of grab hold and hang on. And uh, it's been a wonderful economic engine and uh, lots of opportunities to do things that I wouldn't have had elsewhere. Uh, like, you know, within a couple of years of moving here, I was a member of the symphony board of directors uh, that really wasn't wouldn't happen in most other cities in the united states mm -hmm. uh, i just showed interest and was willing to work and next thing i knew you know i was a member of the board and relatively shortly thereafter a member of the executive committee of the board so um it was a wonderful way for me to reach out and meet lots of other people in town and uh pursue something i really enjoyed that's great can yeah. you play an instrument i cannot I cannot. Played in high school. I was part of a high school band, but mostly I was a singer. Um, because although I, I wasn't terribly great at singing, I could undulate better than anybody else in the band. So they uh, they gave me the lead singer role. Got it. Got it. That's great. Yeah. Um, so you were part of you know the first cohort of Jewish lawyers to be hired by major firms here in Houston. Um, not the first, but but close to the first. Can you tell us some of that story? Yeah, so um, the firm I went to work with when I moved to Houston was called Butler & Binion. It doesn't exist anymore. It's gone out of business. It was the fourth largest firm in Houston at, at that time. And um, uh, I was the first Jewish lawyer they had hired. Um, one other firm, Fulbright and Jaworski, had hired two Jewish lawyers before that, but really not, not any of the other firms in town. Mm -hmm. And so it was really in the front wave of that sort of thing. You know, coming from Biloxi, uh, it was an easy transition for me um, into a firm. Um, they were ready to hire somebody who was Jewish, I think. And so, you know, I, I think uh, all the pieces were in place for me to be successful there and uh, very quickly uh, made partner in that firm. Uh, it was a great, great experience for me. Uh, uh, you know, great place. Lots of really first rate lawyers and uh, first rate people. I know that uh, there were two men in particular who um, were very influential in your life and in your career, uh, Aaron Farfell and, and Ruben Askenaz. Can you talk about them a little bit? Sure, um, I'm happy to. Uh, Aaron Farfell and Ruben Askenaz were partners in, uh, in various business ventures. Uh, they had become extremely successful, uh, had put together one of the country's first conglomerates uh, by putting together even flow baby bottles and Spalding sporting goods and Dunhill Pipes into a company. Uh, it's very unusual for the uh, late 1960s. Um, and th they were a terrific partnership because they were very different people. Uh, Aaron was by and large the good cop and Rube was by and large the bad cop in any negotiations they had. And it proved to be extraordinarily successful for them. They were both very interested in young uh, Jewish people in town and trying to give them an opportunity to, uh, to help themselves. And so um, they, had, they had in their careers both used uh, Butler and Binion uh, among other law firms. And so um, uh, they were very helpful to me in getting the job there in the first place and in making sure that I succeeded when I was there. Um, but both of them played really major roles in my growth in Houston as a person, as a lawyer, uh, and as a Houstonian. Yeah, we have a, a letter in the archive uh, that you wrote, you probably remember this, um, to Aaron Farfell, I think around 19, um, maybe sometime in the late 70s when, when you made partner. When was that? 76 uh, was when I made partner, um, 75, maybe, maybe 75 or 76, something like that. Mm -hmm. And um, so, yes, I was, uh, it was a thank you note uh, 
there, and I wrote one to Rube as well, uh, thanking them for their support and backing and so forth. Yeah, great. And I, I know Rube, Rube was very involved in politics as well. Um, he was very involved in politics. In fact, I first met him involved in politics. Uh, I had gotten involved in uh, a fellow named Fred Hoffine's campaign for mayor. Fred was the son of Roy Hoffines, who was the um, genius behind the Astrodome and the force behind the Astrodome. And Fred was a very bright guy. He had a PhD in economics from the University of Texas and a law degree from the University of Texas and ran for mayor, um, lost the first time, won the second time. Um, and Rube, I'm not quite sure how Rube knew Fred, but Rube had been very involved with uh, that campaign as well. And that's how I first uh, met Rube. He was you know, one of the world's great fundraisers, um, primarily focused on the Jewish community, but not entirely. And uh, he was the first person I ever met, you know, who would have a fundraising event and, you know, basically lock the door and, you know, go through and call on people about how much they were going to give. And um, uh, I mean, I just never seen anybody do anything like that before. Neither had anybody else, frankly, because most of the people in that room were not Jewish. right? <laughs> and uh, uh, they were as stunned as I was at that at that tactic. And uh, you know, it was complete with things like Rube would say, you know, well, how much are you going to give? And somebody would say, well, I'll give a thousand dollars. And he would say, you having a bad year? What do you mean a thousand dollars? You know, that's not enough for you. You, you know, you need to give five. <laughs> and uh, uh, it was a quite uh, revolutionary for uh, fundraising in Houston, Texas. Mm -hmm. Wow. That's, that's quite yeah. a story. Yeah. Um, so, so the association um, between you know you and Ruben Askenaz and the Hoffines family sort of you know led to your involvement in in local politics. Is that something that you that you had your mind set on when you when you came here, or it just sort of developed organically? Well, both, I think. I had always been interested in politics and uh, had been a, you know, a close observer of politics. Uh, in fact, I had an opportunity in 1960, late 67, early 68, to meet Robert Kennedy in uh, Boston. He came uh, into the law firm uh, where I was working um, because one of his um, prep school roommates, Charlie Cabot, was a member of the firm. And so uh, it was you know, quite an exciting time for me uh, right before, relatively right before he was assassinated in 1968. Mm -hmm. um, but I'd always been interested in politics. and. Um, so uh, you know, I was fortunate to get involved in Fred's campaigns early on. Uh, it was an easy candidate to support. Uh, he ran against a longtime incumbent, uh, fairly racist mayor, um, and so Welch, Louis Welch, that was his name, and uh, had a um, longtime racist police chief, a guy named Herman Short, uh, who was very easy to dislike, and so. You know, Fred's campaign for mayor was really to to get a new police chief, and as I say, he lost the first time he ran against Welsh. The second time, Welsh didn't run uh, because he saw the handwriting on the wall, and uh, and Fred won. Fred won narrowly against another conservative opponent, but um, anyway, it, it changed Houston really forever in terms of its approach to uh, to city politics. Um, so so yes, I'd been involved in Fred's campaign, and through that. In addition to Rube, met lots of other people, including a young African-American activist named Mickey Leland, who shortly thereafter ran for uh, the state legislature and was elected. And I had helped him uh, get there. And uh, Mickey and I became great personal friends and spent a lot of time together. Um, and I was a groomsman at his wedding, uh, for instance, and things like that. And so we were great friends. And um, you know, we got to start a program together that uh, continues to this day uh, the Mickey Leland Kibbutzim internship program. So the genesis of that was Mickey had been to Israel on a couple of occasions, um, taken over by various Jewish groups. I think the first one was the ADL uh, as a up and coming young politician. And he'd fallen in love with Israel. He was a very serious Catholic. And so he loved being in the Holy Land. And uh, what he really was enamored of was the kibbutz concept of people living in kind of communal circumstances where, you know, if you wanted your child to take piano lessons, the kibbutz voted on whether or not to spend its money on your child taking piano lessons and things like that. And he thought it was such a revolutionary way to live um, that uh, he thought it would be great to expose young people from his community, inner city Houston, to that way of life. And so in 1980, we started this program. We set up a charity and 
raised money and started this program to send inner city kids to Israel. And now 40 years later, it's still ongoing. And, um, you know, it's revolutionized lots of young people's lives. I mean, we've sent kids who've never been out of Texas or never been on an airplane and things like that. And uh, the criteria for selection is perception of future leadership. Um, and uh, so we have a large diverse board uh, covering all aspects of Houston, uh, including now several of our former interns are now on the board. Um, and so we, you know, we interview and select kids every year. In fact, the hardest thing we do is decide which 10 kids are going and which ones are not going uh, because they're all very deserving of going. But, uh, it, you know, it's just been a fantastic program in terms of exposing kids to the world. Uh, their perspective of the world changes dramatically once they've done that, exposing them to the Holy Land, uh, which they've read about in Bibles, exposing them to the state of Israel, exposing them to the current conflict in the Middle East and so forth. I mean, it, it just transformed who they are as people. Yeah, I think it's, a, it's an incredible program that, um, I suspect is not very well known outside of Houston and perhaps even within Houston, um, you know, since Congressman Leland passed away is, 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 is less well known. But I think it's a really important story, especially, you know, in, in, in our current moment when a lot of um, renewed attention is being paid to black Jewish relations. Um, you know, your, your friendship with Mickey evolved at a time when black Jewish relations were, were not so good. Um, can you can you talk about that a little bit? Sure. Well, of course, Black Jewish relations have historically been very good. I mean, the Jewish community had always identified uh, with the African American community and persecution, and so the early origins of the NAACP and organizations like that had had significant Jewish involvement in it. And um, you know, by the late '60s, early '70s, a lot of that had deteriorated as African American folks wanted to take over their own organizations and didn't want help from white people of any kind. Um, and so relationships began to deteriorate uh, because of that, uh, particularly with younger African-Americans. And so uh, my opportunity to, to be a friend of Mickey's and his of mine, you know, I think really helped bridge a lot of those gaps. And um, through him, I became friends with lots of other African-American uh, politicians or business leaders. Um, spent some time on the board of Texas Southern University, the historically black uh, college here in town, and uh, you know, became much more appreciative of what our Af the richness of our African American community here in Houston and what it's offered to the community. Great. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your relationship with um, Mayor Bob Lanier? Yeah, so Bob Lanier was somebody I knew through politics as well. Um, and uh, got to know him. He's been a very successful uh, banker and real estate developer in town. Uh, I had represented him on a handful of his uh, business dealings. And uh, when he ultimately ran for mayor and was elected, he put his assets into a blind trust so that he wouldn't be um, tempted to do things as mayor that could arguably be in his own best interest. Um, and I was the trustee of that trust. So I ran his businesses for six years while he was the mayor. Uh, that time we had two year terms and uh, three and he ran for three different times and was elected each time, almost always by huge margins. He was extremely popular mayor. Uh, among other things, before he became mayor, he had been head of the Texas Highway Department uh, for several years. He'd been head of the Metropolitan Transit Authority here, Metro here for a few years. And um, so he was very well known, very well regarded. His boyhood hero was always Franklin Roosevelt, uh, although his business dealings made him, you know, lean towards Republicans. Uh, Houston mayors are elected you know, on a nonpartisan basis. They don't run by party. And so he was able to bridge that gap and appeal to really both sides of the community. Mm -hmm. Great. Do you, do you have a favorite Mayor Lanier story that you like to tell? Um, no, only that, you know, he... he uh, well, I guess the one I would I would um, emphasize is the one about um, his demanding that uh, more minority contractors would be used on city businesses, mm. um, and uh, he had lots of conversations with business leaders at the time 
talking about uh, their responsibility to take someone with whom they had worked and had a good relationship who happened to be African American mm -hmm. and helping them start their own business and using them to be the subcontractors on deals and so forth, rather than working for them uh, to help them start their own business. Yeah. Um, and so he pushed very hard for that to happen. And it worked in, in numerous cases uh, where people began to be able to build up their own equity in the businesses they own. Yeah. Great. I'm, I'm realizing now that we forgot to talk about um, when, when Mickey Leland died. Uh, Sorry, I didn't hear that, Josh. Say it again. I, I, I forgot to ask you about, you know, when, when Mickey Leland tragically died, your, your memories of, of how you found out and its effect on you. Um, well, it was a very, very traumatic time for all of us. Uh, Mickey had been uh, one of his uh, one of his pet goals in life was to try to eradicate hunger around in the U.S. and around the world. And um, uh, so he was the head of a congressional committee on hunger and was delivering supplies to remote Ethiopia when his plane crashed. And he and the other folks on board were killed. Um, you know, there was a several days of um, not knowing what had happened. The plane disappeared and uh, it took three or four days for them to actually find the wreckage. And um, so there was a long time of people, you know, unsure of what exactly had happened. Um, I remember it very vividly. I was actually in Biloxi visiting my mother with my family. Uh, and um, when the word, you know, finally came through, uh, that uh, Mickey had been lost. Um, I got a call from his widow, Allison, who said they had found the plane and no one had survived. And uh, again, it was a very, very sad time. And, uh, uh, it, uh, it led to a very uh, sad funeral. Um, although Mickey died doing what he would have wanted, uh, what he wanted to do and the way he would have wanted to die, uh, is helping, trying to help other people. Um, and, also led to one of my least favorite experiences in that uh, at Mickey's funeral, which was a very elaborate affair where uh, Congress um, uh, commandeered a couple of private airplanes and I don't know, 60 or 70 members of Congress flew down to Houston for his funeral. It was at, at Texas Southern University. And uh, so I was one of the speakers and uh, they said to me, you know, here, here's your spot. You're gonna speak right after Jesse Jackson to which I said, I don't want to speak right after Jesse Jackson. I'd like to speak before Jesse Jackson. Nobody wants to follow Jesse Jackson. But nonetheless, I had to. So I did the best I could under the circumstances. Right. Yeah. No, he was a, he was a special man, Mickey Lee London. His memory lives on in the internship that you, uh, you know, continue to, um, to see through. Really quite. Well, we've done this in Mickey's memory, really, and to try to... Uh, continue Mickey's memory. And it's interesting, you know, the, the, as the years roll by, the uh, students we interview are less and less aware of the name Mickey Leland, although there's several monuments to Mickey in town still, but less and less aware of that. And um, so part of what we do when we select these 10 interns is we, we run them through an education program before we put them on a plane and fly them off to Israel, including um, sort of a Christian perspective on Israel, uh, the current Middle East situation, a history of the region. But one of the things we talk about is um, Mickey and you know who he was and, and what he meant and other, other really African-American leaders in Houston um, over the years. And uh, so that's been very, very enlightening to people too. Although frankly, now, um, the, the, when we started the program 40 years ago, I would say on an average class, they were six African-Americans, two Hispanics, uh, one Anglo and one something else was kind of the average class. Although we didn't have any quotas in terms of who we were picking. Today is probably four Hispanics and three African-Americans and two Anglos and two Asians, or if that number adds up to 10. Uh, I mean, the, the composition of the people who go uh, have changed dramatically, partially because the 18th Congressional District, which Mickey represented and is now represented by Congress member Sheila Jackson Lee, has changed dramatically over that time as well. Right. It's branched out from being simply an inner city 
district to a much broader district, including some parts of West Houston in it as well. Right, sure. Um, Kenny, can we talk a little bit more about your broader involvement in the in the Houston Jewish community? Um, I know you've been involved with um, the local chapter of the American Jewish um, Committee. Can you talk about that a little bit? Sure. Um, actually, the American Jewish Committee was one of Rube Askenaz's um, causes. Uh, he felt very strongly about it and uh, got me and, and, and lots of other young Jewish professionals in town involved in the American Jewish Committee. It always appealed to me because uh, one, of the, one of the things that the uh, American Jewish Committee had done was um, there had been a, um, a, a Nazi party march uh, in Skokie, Illinois, uh, designed to go through Jewish neighborhoods in Illinois. And the American Jewish Committee had filed an amicus brief on behalf of the Nazi party's right to do that, um, which always appealed to me as sort of the way this country ought to work and the way even interest groups ought to view how important our uh, democratic institutions are. And so that kind of, uh, I don't know, sort of pragmatism, a principled pragmatism, I guess I would call it, uh, always appealed to me. So I got very involved in the American Jewish Committee. I had become their local uh, Houston uh, chapter president, and then I became a regional president, which covered five states. I served on the National Board of Governors uh, for several years and um, spent a fair amount of time in that capacity uh, uh, attending meetings, various meetings in New York and elsewhere. And um, so it was a very um, enlightening and uh, rewarding experience for me. And what were, what were some of the key issues, you know, on the, either on the local scene or the regional or, or national level during your, your tenure in, in leadership? Well, lo locally uh, was almost always uh, relationships with other communities in, in, in our community. Um, and so American Jewish Committee spent an awful lot of time uh, working on building relationships with black and brown and Asian and other communities, uh, gay and elsewhere, uh, that could be helpful, that the AJC could be helpful to them in terms of trying to uh, help them achieve where they wanted to go in, in our community here in Houston. Mm -hmm. um, nationally, it was um, like every national organization at that time, probably dominated by Israel matters but also anti-Semitism in the Soviet Union and elsewhere um, that the American Jewish Committee uh, was involved in trying to er eradicate. Uh, American Jewish Committee works differently than other Jewish organizations. It's a very much behind the scenes, quiet um, uh, advocacy group that doesn't uh, seek publicity or headlines, but tries to make things happen uh, behind the scenes. And as I said, over the years, they've been extraordinarily effective in that. Right. Very good. Um, we should move on and talk about um, your involvement with the uh, Harris County Houston Sports Authority. Okay. Well, um, you know, I played a lot of sports growing up. Sports has been a big part of my life. Um, and um, so uh, when the Harris County Houston Sports Authority was started, uh, which I, I guess I'll take a step back and explain how that came about. So while Bob Lanier was mayor, uh, the Houston Oilers uh, left town because the city refused to build them a new stadium. Um, the, the county had recently spent a fair amount of money refurbishing the Astrodome where they played, uh, but they wanted their own stadium. They didn't want a multi-purpose stadium. And uh, Bob Lanier uttered the uh, you know, memorable lines of, you know, why should Joe Sixpack have to pay for a stadium that's going to be controlled by a billionaire and played in by millionaires? And, you know, what's the equity of that? And um, so the Oilers left town. They got a fabulous deal from Nashville, uh, which in addition to paying for their moving, guaranteed them 10 years worth of sellouts uh, in the stadium. So they, they didn't sell the tickets. The city bought the tickets. Um, so it was a great deal for Bud Adams, the owner of the, of the Oilers. Um, but they left, and um, there, there was a fair amount of conversation about maybe the Rockets or the Astros leaving as well, mm -hmm. uh, also who began looking for their own stadium. So Lanier, as I said earlier, was very smart and very savvy in politics, uh, put together the notion of the Harris County Houston Sports Authority and sold it in Austin to the, uh, to the legislature and got the legislature to pass it. And basically it is that the 
stadiums here in town are financed by bonds that have been issued by the sports authority. It's a governmental entity that can issue its own bonds. Mm -hmm. uh, but the bonds are paid off by hotel motel tax, car rental tax, and rental from the teams who lease the stadiums so that there's literally no local taxpayer involvement in it. And um, which I thought was an absolutely brilliant way to, to do that. Um, when it began, Lanier asked me to, to chair it. I told him I didn't have the time to do that. I was right in the middle of uh, you know, major uh, legal issues of representing several matters that were bubbling to the surface. And so I didn't have time to do it. But um, a few years later, his successor, Lee Brown, uh, asked me to at least go on the board, if not chair it. And a couple of years after that, I became the chairman of it. So uh, I've been chairman of it for about 12 years now. And uh, it's been immensely rewarding uh, in addition to building and, and overseeing the bonds uh, that were issued to build the stadiums. Uh, we've kind of morphed into a sports marketing operation for Harris County mm -hmm. uh, so that um, sporting events that want to, a place to have a, have venues, uh, we, we go out and hustle and try to bring them to town. And we've been very successful in doing that. Everything from, you know, AAU Junior Olympics to um, the Olympic uh, boxing trials to uh, uh, we, we were the host city for the Olympic marathon trials 10 years ago, uh, things like that. So anything that being, brings people to town, uh, puts people's heads on beds and rear ends in cars is good for us to help us pay off our bonds. Um, and it's good for the community because it uh, you know, multiplies the impact of those uh, out-of-city dollars. Uh, so it, it, it's been a really, really successful endeavor in, in those terms. Uh, brought lots of business to town, revitalized the east side of downtown Houston by building the baseball stadium and the basketball arena on the east side of downtown Houston. Mm -hmm. um, added you know, millions of dollars to local coffers uh, because of the taxes uh, being paid by businesses over there. And um, it's, it's, been, it's been a really good thing for the community. Yeah. Um, so we're doing this interview in the, you know, the last days of, of 2020 and the COVID pandemic is, is still raging. And I'm sure this has had an effect on, um, you know, all of the, the sports teams and businesses that, that you just mentioned. From the perspective of the, of the you know, sports authority, how, is, how has this year been? And, and what, what do you think the outlook is looking, uh, moving forward? Well, this year has been challenging for the Sports Authority along with everybody else. I mean, we've had, of course, numerous cancellations of events that were planned to be in Houston and uh, which we were involved with uh, bringing to Houston. Um, so hotel motel tax collections, car rental collections are off dramatically from prior years. Mm -hmm. uh, at the beginning of this, we realized that this might last a while. And so we, we did a new bond issue where we, in effect, uh, moved out obligations for the next three years to the back end of our bond obligations so that we are very comfortable that we can meet all of our ongoing obligations uh, and uh, bought ourselves two or three years of running room to mm -hmm. get uh, collections back up to where they, they otherwise should be. Um, so we feel very good about that. We think we did the responsible right thing to do in that regard. And um, you know, we're fairly confident that uh, you know, we'll quickly get back to where we had been uh, prior to this, as soon as the world returns to some semblance of normalcy. Which we hope is, is not too far away. We certainly hope that. Yeah, it's, boy, is it, is it sorely needed. Yeah. Um, so um, let's, you know, move now on, on the theme of sports, talking about um, your family a little bit more um, and uh, your son, Andrew, uh, whose Los yeah. Angeles Dodgers uh, just won the World Series just a couple of months ago. Right. Tell us a little bit about, you know, Andrew's involvement in, in sports and, and how he um, got into the world of uh, sports management and running a baseball team. So I have five children, uh, all of whom are wonderful, and eight grandchildren who are even better than their parents, of course. And um, the, the oldest two are girls, the next three are boys. Uh, Andrew is number four of the five. And um, Andrew had, uh, had always been interested in sports, uh, really from the beginning, and uh, in sports in general and baseball in particular. 
Mm -hmm. uh, he very quickly became quite a student of the game and was a very, very good uh, player himself. He, uh, in high school, he was asked to play on a U.S. all-star team that played in China, uh, in a tournament in China. Um, and so he went to Tulane on a baseball scholarship, uh, uh, significantly better player than was his father. And uh, uh, again, like me, about halfway through, he realized he wasn't going to be a major league player and so spent you know, much more time paying attention in school and ended up uh, doing really well and uh, ended up on Wall Street. Um, Kenny, he, he had gone to Tulane on a baseball scholarship just as you had, right? That's correct. Okay, That's so, correct. He, so he did play at Tulane. and then Yeah, he did play at Tulane. He was an outfielder and um, was hurt a lot of the time, but uh, various injuries of one kind or another, but yeah, he did. And um, anyway, he ended up at, on Wall Street at uh, Bear Stearns, the investment bank at Bear Stearns, um, where he did extremely well, and then uh, joined a venture capital firm uh, in New York. Uh, for a few years, but it always had a, an ongoing interest in baseball and had spent a lot of that time uh, sort of looking around for other uh, for baseball opportunity, opportunities in baseball of one kind or another. Um, it was very fortunate uh, while in New York, he uh, met a fellow had been at um, uh, Goldman Sachs, who was from Dallas, was also a big baseball enthusiast and um, that guy's name is Matt Silverman said to Andrew um, one day you know I've got this fellow who worked with me who's looking to buy a baseball team and with your baseball background you know I ought to introduce you to him maybe you could be of help to him so he introduced him to a man named uh, Stu Silverman and um, and so uh, I'm sorry Stu Sternberg He's and so Stu Sternberg who eventually bought the Tampa Bay Rays and when he bought them Matt uh, and Andrew were his investment bankers on the deal. And so they handled that deal for him. Uh, and when he bought the Rays, the, the managing general partner of the former ownership group said he wanted to do it for three more years, but that uh, as part of the deal, he would agree to sell in three years. But uh, Sternberg could send down two people to protect his investment, a financial guy and a baseball guy. So Matt was the financial guy and Andrew was the baseball guy. Both of them left significant amounts of money on the table and uh, moved to Tampa, Florida. Uh, and Andrew's role was assistant to the GM or some such. And uh, uh, not surprisingly, the, the arrangement with the former owner lasted about a year, not three years. And uh, when they finally booted him out, uh, Andrew became the general manager of the Tampa Bay Rays at age 27. Wow. Uh, and so, as I tell everybody, he got a lot of publicity, most of which was, why would anybody turn a baseball team over to this kid? But uh, he was fortunate. It worked out well for him. The team did really well. Um, ended up in the World Series one year, but every year were competitive, uh, even though their, their payroll was a fraction of other teams' payrolls, particularly in the American League East, which is where they played because both the Yankees and the Red Sox were in the American League East, but Tampa played them uh, close every year. Uh, they were competitive every single year. And mm -hmm. um, uh, after almost 10 years of that, uh, Andrew was hired away by the LA Dodgers in late 2014 um, to go take over their team. So he became the president of baseball operations for the Dodgers. Um, and that's where he's been since. Right. And they've had a really incredible run of, of success finally culminating in a World Series. And of course, um, in 2017, uh, the World Series featured the Houston Astros and the Los Angeles Dodgers. And so you, yeah. probably more than any other person on the planet, found yourself in uh, something of a predicament, right? You're on the, you're on the board, maybe even the chairman of the uh, yeah. Harris County Houston Sports Authority, and, and then your son is the general manager of, of the other team. So how did that play out? Well, it was, as you pointed out, it was a difficult time for us. Um, and uh, as I've told a lot of people, my son created my 15 minutes of fame because uh, I got interviewed by everybody right? <laughs> from, from the New York Times on down about, you know, what in the world are you doing here? You're, you're the chair of the board of the, uh, of the entity that's the landlord of these stadiums. And yet your son is running the other team. And how are you dealing with this? And I kind of evolved into an answer, which basically went along the lines of, look, I'm a lifelong Houston Astros fan and a 30 plus year season ticket holder. It would be fabulous for this community, for the Astros to win this World Series. 
but I'm going to root for the team that pays my son, which everybody went, oh, yeah, I get that. I understand that. So um, Sports Authority has a suite in the stadium, which we use to entertain dignitaries and things like that. And so before the World Series games in Houston, uh, my wife and I would go to that suite uh, about an hour, hour and a half before game time and would uh, spend time as the hosts in the suite, uh, entertaining people and visiting with folks. And about the second inning, we would slip out and go into the stands and sit with the Dodger families <laughs> where our tickets were um, and watch the rest of the game from there. And uh, so I tell people all the time, my, my wife and I were the only people in the stadium who had no colors of either team on. We were completely neutral. <laughs> and, uh, I was going to ask if you had your Astros jersey and your Dodgers hat on or how you... <laughs> how you managed it. Um, and of course, you know, that, that series went seven games and the Astros ultimately prevailed. And it was, um, you know, later revealed that the Astros had been engaged in an elaborate um, sign stealing scheme, um, which involved, you know, putting a camera in, in center field of Minute Maid Park to, to steal the opposing team's right. pitching signs. I mean, talk, talk just, just as, a, as a baseball fan, um, I'm interested in, you know, your thoughts on, on the scandal and, and how significant you think it is. Well, I think it's, you know, I think it's really a tragedy uh, for the Astros uh, organization uh, and for the players. Uh, the Astros were a great team. They didn't need to do that in order to be successful. Um, uh, you know, I'm not quite sure how it evolved, but clearly at the end of the day, they were doing things that were well beyond the pale and everyone in baseball knew it was well beyond the pale. Uh, I, I suspect that history is not going to be kind to the Astros. I mean, I suspect they will end up being a much like the 1919 Chicago Black Sox mm -hmm. um, in, in memory of people uh, because of that, uh, that cheating scandal. Um, so, you know, it, it, it's, just, it's just sad for me uh, as an Astros fan that they have to live with that and the players have to live with that um, for this period of time. Um, I think the most telling thing to me was not uh, the Dodgers reaction to it or even the Yankees whom the Astros had knocked out in the round before the World Series. Uh, both of them were unhappy when they discovered what had gone on, but it was the other players around the league. I mean, the quotes from other players on other teams who weren't involved and that, you know, those playoffs that year were very, very damning um, for the Astros. And I mean, I think that's the indication that most people have taken away um, about how difficult that situation was. Right. Yeah. Well, the Astros did uh, nearly make it back to the World Series um, in 2020 with a, with a new manager. And but they uh, were defeated by by Andrew's old team. Uh, Tampa Bay Rays, who met the Los Angeles Dodgers in the World Series of all things. And right. All of this was was unfolding, you know, during the pandemic. So you don't have 30,000, you know, screaming fans hanging on every pitch, you know, live as, as, as it's unfolding. So tell us about, you know, your perspective on, on this baseball po postseason you know, as the Dodgers are making their run back to the World Series and ultimately, you know, triumphing. Did you did you go to any of the games? Were you just watching at home? What were your conversations with Andrew like as it was all taking place? Well, it was, you know, it was a difficult year. Um, it was great that the Astros almost made it back um, to the World Series. I mean, again, they didn't have a terrific year, but they had a great playoff run. And um, uh, so, you know, it would have been nice, I think, um, for the Astros to make it back. Although I've had friends who said, you know, it probably wouldn't have been so nice because all of the national stories would have been on the 2017, about the 2017 World Series. And it would have just brought it all back up again. So, you know, maybe, maybe it worked out well for the Astros in that regard. Mm -hmm. um, but it was difficult for us again, the family, because we were all still Tampa Bay Rays fans <laughs> from Andrew's time down there and his relationship down there with all those folks who were like a family together. Um, in Tampa. And, uh, you know, we still feel very positively about all of those people. Uh, it was interesting because I can't remember whether it was the Wall Street Journal of the Times, but had an article when there were four teams left, um, the Astros, the Rays, the Dodgers, and the Braves. Uh, the other three teams, general managers, had all worked for Andrew at one time. 
And so, you know, he really had his hand in all four of the teams in the finals for the, uh, for the championship. So that was a, that was a nice tribute to him. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the actual games themselves uh, were played in Arlington, you know, just a couple hundred miles up the road, but we did not go uh, primarily because the teams and the families of the teams were quarantined in a hotel in the Arlington area so that while we could have gone to the games, we couldn't visit with our kids or grandkids while we were there. We could wave at them across a parking lot or something. And that just didn't seem to have much appeal uh, to my wife and I. So we, we did not go. Um, our, our other two sons, uh, our oldest son and our youngest son, both went to several of the games there. Mm -hmm. And both had the same report, which was neither of them felt terribly comfortable in the stadium. Because although everyone had to wear a mask to get into the stadium, once inside and once people began drinking, uh, masks went away and uh, spacing went away. And mm -hmm. it was a very uncomfortable uh, situation for them. And so um, that just confirmed our decision was correct not to go to the game. But it was hard. It's hard watching him on television and not being there. Uh, did talk to Andrew several times during that time. And, uh, you know, his goal was to uh, was to eradicate the 32-year uh, uh, drought in L.A. Uh, from winning a World Series. Uh, last time they had won was 1988. And so, um, you know, they were thrilled they were able to do it. Um, I think he's been quoted several times as saying, actually, it was a feeling more of relief than it was of euphoria uh, to get it done, yeah. but um, that they were excited to get it done. And you know, as you know, I mean, playoffs in any sport are relatively random, but in baseball, more random than others, um, because, uh, you know, in baseball, the best teams win 60% of their games and the worst teams win 40% of their games. Right. So if you theoretically put the best team with the worst team and played a five game series, the best team should win three and the worst team should win two, right? So you put two 60% winning teams together and it's impossible to handicap that. You right. Um, so, uh, so because playoffs are so random in baseball uh, generally, um, you know, it's quite a relief to finally get there. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm sure. Hopefully you'll, you'll have a chance to celebrate one in, in person one of these days. No question. No question. We're anxiously awaiting an opportunity to fly out to LA and, or maybe to Phoenix uh, for spring training. We don't, we don't know yet. Uh, yeah, I guess right. Spring training could be around the corner. I don't know how the season will be, you know, affected, but that would be. Yeah, no one knows yet. They don't, they don't know whether they're going to start spring training on time in mid February or push it back and therefore push the season back and have fewer games again. Mm -hmm. um, you know, probably more than the 60 they played last year, but less than 162 that a normal season would have. No, no one really knows yet. There's still sort of feeling their way along with the virus and with the negotiations, frankly, between the Players Association and the owners as to how that all will unfold. Yeah, we'll have to we'll have to wait and see, but I imagine we'll find out soon. Yeah. And then and then what about you know your you you and Ann during the during this pandemic since last March. How, how has it affected you personally, um, you know, these last several months? What, what has this been like for you? Well, you know, we, we've tried to be as careful as we can be in terms of uh, protecting ourselves uh, during this time. We've actually been exposed four different times to someone who subsequently uh, turned up positive. So we've had four different tests after those exposures. Fortunately, we're negative each of those times. Right. So it just goes to show you, no matter how much you try, you don't necessarily always accomplish that. It's been a great time for us in many ways. Uh, we've had a lot, a lot of opportunities to spend time together. It's been great. Uh, we've seen more movies on TV in a year than we'd seen in you know, 30 years prior to that. Um, but, um, you know, it's, just, it's been fine. It's been fine. We're both working from home. And, um, you know, it's been a really nice, really nice time. I, Sorry, we don't get to spend more time with the children, although we have evolved into a system of visiting with the kids from, and grandkids from time to time. We have meals outside in our backyard with uh, every tent, every family gets its own table. And uh, so we make sure we're socially distanced and things like that. Every family goes into the kitchen and, and gets the food and brings it back out, uh, you know, one family at a time kind of thing. And at least so far it's worked just fine. Um, so we feel good about that. We've also done that with friends a few times too. Same kind of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, so socially distanced backyard dining. Um, 
socially distant backyard dining is is yeah. is in and how lucky we are that we live in Houston and you can do this in December. Absolutely correct. Yeah. Absolutely correct. We just got a note this morning from some really dear friends who want to have a picnic in their backyard uh, tomorrow night, in fact, right? So because the weather's supposed to turn bad on Wednesday. So we're going to we're going to go have a picnic in their backyard tomorrow night. So uh, nice. we're very fortunate to be in a city where we can do that. Yeah. Don't have to worry about blizzards and right. terrible, terrible weather. Kenny, as you look back over a long and distinguished career, both in the legal field and um, public service, right, being on the board of so many great civic organizations, I'm, I'm curious to hear, what, what do you consider to be your, your crowning achievement or your greatest accomplishment? What, what, what are you proudest of? Oh, thanks, Josh. I, you know, I've been very fortunate um, being in Houston, Texas, when I when I have been here. As I said earlier, it, it's made a lot of successes out of a lot of very ordinary folks, including me. Um, and I've been we've been lucky to be, you know, managing partner of major law firms. I've been the in-house general counsel of major corporations over the years. I've uh, been on lots of different civic boards. I've been on lots of different Jewish boards. But but you know, I really think my proudest accomplishments are you know, really twofold. One are my children, I have five wonderful children, uh, all of whom have grown into fabulous human beings and I'm so proud of all of them. Uh, and they've done an even better job of raising my grandchildren, my eight grandchildren. Um, so uh, that's one thing. The second is, you know, I've been fortunate, I, I've been married twice and uh, both my first wife, Barbara, and my second wife, Anne, have been great uh, spouses for me. Um, Anne and I have been together 30 years and um, She's a fabulous helpmate and, uh, and partner in everything I do. And I'm really fortunate to be married to her. Um, she has a wonderful sense of humor and a great outlook on life. Uh, she has both a law degree and a PhD in psychology and she teaches meditation um, as a profession. And so uh, she's always uh, got the right perspective on almost any uh, situation. Uh, so I'm very fortunate, I'm a fortunate guy to have her in my life. Great. Thank you so much, Kenny, for your, your time today. I, I really appreciate it. This is a fascinating interview. It touched on so many different topics in, in Southern Jewish history, in Houston history, and I'm sure people will be, be watching and, and learning from it for years to come. Thank you so much. Thank you, Josh. Appreciate it very much. Take care. You bet. Bye-bye.